But without further ado, then, I give you Rabbi Michael Penitz of Temple Israel and longtime friend of our congregation as well. Please help us welcome him to our background. Shalom, shalom friends. Shalom. I've been eagerly anticipating uh, being able to come back and it turns out you've, you've given me a new and very bright room. <laughs> last, last time I was teaching in a movie projection studio <laughs> up the stairs and uh, actually there have been any number of venues. However, you guys are looking great. You have functioning bathrooms again. <laughs> so let no one say that there is not genuine progress. <laughs> Friends, you may know that it's a little bit odd for a rabbi to employ the term Old Testament because it is not a Jewish nomenclature. Uh, we have a different term that we use, and I'll, I'll get to it in a minute, but I deliberately use the word Old Testament because I want to build a bridge. But this is not a simple bridge like the uh, George Washington Bridge over the Hudson. This is more like the Triborough Bridge. If you, if you know that part of uh, East River, right, connecting three different boroughs, right, Manhattan and the Bronx and Queens, it, connects them all, because there are three different places of familiarity which I want to join, I want to bridge. The first place of familiarity is the traditional Christian lens on this important scriptural material, and that's why I, I use the word Old Testament. So what is the default assumption when one employs the term Old Testament, it seems obvious. You know, I've got, I've got an old car in my driveway, and I've, no, I've got an old car in my driveway, and I've got a new car on the outside of the driveway, so that if somebody wants to steal a car, they're not gonna steal the, the new one, right? The old one is on the outside. Right? <laughs> old usually means there's also new, right? Um, the New Testament is, of course, foundational in Christianity, and it also provides the lens for understanding the Old Testament in traditional Christian teaching. Uh, this was most clearly stated very early in uh, the Christian patristic era um, by uh, Eusebius, one of the church fathers, the Bishop of Caesarea, who said that the Old Testament is the preparatio evangelii. It's the preparation for hearing the good news, which means that there's a kind of a bookend, bookend way of understanding the two. And sometimes it is, to a Jewish mind, very, very fanciful, but also very, very um, artistic. Uh, you may know the book, uh, The Great Code by Northrop Frye, the great literary critic. And Northrop Frye describes Mother Eve and the Virgin Mary as bookends. And to me, this sounds a little bit like the advice that some of you mothers may have given your daughters before senior prom. <laughs> Sex equals sin equals death. <laughs> That's Eve. <laughs> Virgin Mary, the antidote to all that. <laughs> Virgin birth, pure salvation, re regained immortality, right? That, that's a kind of a bookend reading. You may be less familiar with the fact that in the traditional Jewish lens, there's also the Hebrew Testament is the first half of something else. That's less well known to Christians. The, the Hebrew Testament is called Torah Shebichtav, the written law, the written law. So obviously, if you say the written law, you mean there's also something which is an unwritten law. 
And in rabbinics, there's a great preoccupation with the unwritten law. You see an early phase of this in some of the adversarial stories in the Gospels, where Jesus is in dialogue with other people who would interpret Jewish law and say, well, you can do this, you can't do that. He says, no, no, you can do this. Right? So for example, the unwritten law debates over healing on the Sabbath. It turns out that uh, rabbinic Judaism is on the side of the, sa of the issue that Jesus is on. The laws for the Sabbath are suspended up to a point for the sake of healing. Not surprising, but what is in intriguing is how the rabbis justified that. Because being good constitutional lawyers, they need a proof text for everything. So their proof text is Leviticus 18, where God says to Moses to tell the Israelites, these are the laws that you shall live by. Laws that you shall live by. Laws not intended to kill you. Laws intended for you to be able to live by them. Hence, you have a rabbinic doctrine that the laws of the Sabbath are temporarily suspended to save a life. Indeed, how otherwise would you have so many Orthodox Jewish women and men nowadays working as MDs in hospitals? They don't work six days a week until maybe they establish their practice, right? We've had people here who've been interns and residents. You're not in charge of your own schedule, right? You heal when you need to heal. So there is a very extensive body of unwritten law, which today has been written down. That's called the Talmud. And it is so much more extensive than the written law itself. But my point is that the Hebrew Bible in both Jewish and Christian traditions, the Hebrew Bible is understood as the first word in an ongoing conversation, ideally between our faith community and the divine source of our faith community that doesn't end and that won't end. And then there's a third lens, which has occasionally been regarded as an enemy of either of these first two lenses, and I'm putting my cards on the table right away. I wanna show you that this third lens can actually not only not be an enemy, but can actually be a friend to the first two lenses. The third lens is the academic and critical studies lens used for studying this literature. That was a, a lens that was developed by scholars at the time of the French Enlightenment and then more so in the 19th century with the development of the modern university. Think about it. Scholars were beginning to use new tools for understanding ancient texts like Homer. Classic scholars were, were, were making all sorts of breakthroughs understanding the great classics of the Hellenistic tradition. Other classics were just coming into purview after the, uh, the British jurist Jones was assigned to India and he began studying Sanskrit and he came to realize that Sanskrit is an Indo-European language like Greek and like Latin and like English and like German. And he, he began the Western study of the Vedic and the Vedantic literature, the Rig Veda and so on and so forth. So there was all sorts of quasi-secular study of various religions' sacred texts. Well, what about Jewish and Christian sacred texts? If you've never read a book, there's a, a good book for you to read. It's a little tedious, but you know, read it like you eat a box of chocolates, you know, a little bit of the time. <laughs> Hopefully a little bit of the time. It, it's called um, The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer, the great uh, musicologist, right? And the great humanitarian. Also, by the way, a great Bach specialist. But also, he, he was also a very fine historian of theology. And he shows you how decade after decade, the advances in 
the intellectual life of the university world, mostly in Germany, but also in other parts of the Western world in the early 1800s, lead to new lenses for the study of sacred scriptures. And he's thinking mostly about the New Testament, but the same thing happens with the Hebrew Testament. Now, one can go in different directions with that. And some of the people took that in an anti-religious direction. The 19th century was a time when some people said there is warfare between science and religion. And they felt that religion was the outmoded explanation and that science is the new and improved explanation. Folks who felt that way were especially from the world of geology and biology. So consider this. The Bible does not explicitly say how old the world is. And you, you can look as closely as you want. It's not an explicit statement, the world is this old or that old. But the traditions of understanding how old the, the world is based on Bible study, which included some untested default assumptions, led to a, an estimation of some thousands of years old. Um, Archbishop Usher famously said that the world was created on a Wednesday <laughs> at 9 a.m. in the year 4004 before the Christian era. <laughs> I knew Wednesdays were a bad day for getting up. <laughs> By the way, I, I have my own, uh, my own translation for BC and AD, and I think that you can appreciate this. BC, before COVID. <laughs> AD, anno dementiae. <laughs> so that's my own understanding of BC and, and AD. In scholarly circles, you'll often see before the common era or common era, BCE or CE. And that, that's, that's kind of like the PC way of saying BC. <laughs> so the PC way of BC is BCE. So if Archbishop Usher told us that the world is 6,000 some odd years old, what do we do when the geologist James Hutton takes a look at these rock formations in, New, in uh, Great Britain and says it's inconceivable that this could have happened in that scale of time. Or if you want a more modern example of it, go to the Grand Canyon. Well, who's been to the Grand Canyon? Okay, those layers, those strata, right? It's like, you know, God's seven layer cake. <laughs> now you do have some folks who say, no, no, it was all done, all done very quickly. The flood ac accomplished all this. And they're called new, new earth creationists young earth creationists, and they'll, they'll hand out flyers there. It doesn't work scientifically. Uh, we, have, we have all sorts of ways of dating rocks nowadays based on isotopes. And um, the age of rocks is not something that is you know, politically uh, suspect to an agenda. Although I do want to tell you the, the wonderful statement that William Jennings Bryan who was a fundamentalist, said in response to Clarence Darrow at the Scopes trial. Uh, Darrow shows him a, a fossil rock. You know, it's, it's opened up and there's a fossil on the inside. And it's from the Appalachians, right, right there in Tennessee. The, the trial was in Dayton, Tennessee, just about 100 years ago. And uh, Darrow says to Jennings, uh, how old do you think this rock is, sir? And Jennings pulls himself up and says, I am not interested in the age of rocks. I am interested in the rock of ages. <laughs> it's a beautiful answer. What a great answer. <laughs> what I want to tell you is that you can be trusting of the scientific consensus of the age of rocks without it impairing your faith in the rock of ages. That, that's really what I'm trying to tell you that intellectual changes in the 20th century and now the 21st century have moved us well beyond that 19th century somewhat frozen consensus that 
science is here, religion is here, religion is shrinking like the famous poem by Matthew Arnold, Dover Beach, the tide of faith is going out. Religion explains less and less and less and less. Science explains more and more and more and more. What's gonna be left for religion? We no longer feel that way. At least many of us no longer feel that way, although I know some churches where they do, and they, they say, no, no, we're gonna reject science because of that. So the new look that I want to give you is accepting of the various advances in the secular realm for understanding life. And it's confident that we can use those to help us refine and make more mature the faith that we have and not, not corrode it. The only kind of faith that that will corrode is immature faith. It might weaken your belief that there is an Easter bunny who somehow can lay chocolate eggs. <laughs> it, should not, uh, it should not erode your faith in, in, in God. Now, it's not only a matter of natural science, it's also a matter of history. And this gets us closer to home. What did we know of the history of the part of the world where the Hebrew Testament unfolds? prior to 1800. We had the Hebrew Testament. We had certain ancient authors uh, like um, Josephus Flavius, who wrote about that part of the world. We had some Greco-Roman authors who wrote about uh, the uh, nations that the Greeks and the Romans were encountering. But we didn't have a lot. This changed during the Napoleonic Wars, when trying to outflank the uh, British blockade against, against him, Napoleon decided to conquer the Middle East, and he's gonna outflank the British. So he sends an army to Egypt, and uh, the British uh, surprise the naval squad, the French naval squadron that was supporting the army, they destroy it, and that army is left to wither on the vine. Ultimately, Napoleon escapes it, he gets back to France, that army holds out for a couple of years and then it surrenders. But while it, did, while it was there, they came up with a fascinating discovery. It was a trilingual inscription. A fairly garden variety text, you know, King Ptolemy the whatever is giving a land grant of thus and such to so and so. You know, it's the kind of land deed that you would expect to see in a municipal office. But what was great about it is that it was in three languages. It was in Greek, because after Alexander the Great, the kings and queens of Egypt spoke Greek. They were, they were from a dynasty that started with one of Alexander's general, Ptolemy. By the way, anyone know who the last Ptolemaic monarch was? Oh, you do, she had violet eyes in the movie. What, what great, beautiful queen was portrayed by Elizabeth Taylor? Cleopatra. And do you remember how she, uh, she escaped scrutiny to get to see Caesar? This is based on ancient literature. Cleopatra sends him a rug, remember that? And he unrolls the rug and she's there. That's great, great moment. Great moment. <laughs> so Cleopatra was the last of this dynasty of Greek-speaking monarchs. And so, not surprisingly, the first, the, the first language was uh, Hellenistic Greek, which every educated uh, Englishman and every educated Frenchman could read. That was part of their education from Renaissance times until the early 20th century. The next language was called Demotic, which is like, you know, street Egyptian. <laughs> they could read that too. The third language was the strange, hitherto undeciphered picture writing that was known from Egyptian ancient inscriptions, pyramids, uh, monuments, stelae, and so on and so forth. Hieroglyphics. Since we had a trilingual text, and it was clear that the second was a translation of the first, 
it was a valid inference that the third is the same text. So they knew what the words had to mean, but they couldn't read it yet. Now this was the era of the Napoleonic Wars and intense national competition. British teams, French teams were fighting over who's gonna to get to crack this. But finally, the French scholar Champollion uh, came up with the decisive uh, breakthrough and ultimately they did work collaboratively. By the 1830s, Western scholars could read hieroglyphics and it opened up the world of Egyptian history. And we were able to begin to correlate it with information from the Bible, which we're gonna see some today. A few decades later, the same kind of advance was done in the Fertile Crescent, in the area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, you know, so well known today from the various political uh, problems that we've had in that part of the world. So the great age of Egyptology and the great age of Assyriology coincided in the 1800s. And by the mid to late 1800s, we knew a lot about the world that is the framework for the story of the Hebrew Bible. So that ought to be able to help us. Now, there were those, again, who were, uh, science is right and the Bible is wrong. Uh, one, one of the worst examples of this was a professor in Berlin. His name was Delich, D-E-L-I-Z-S-C-H, Franz Delich, who wrote a book called Babel und Bibel, Babel and Bible. And his thesis is that everything good that you see in the Hebrew Bible is derivative from Babylonian culture and everything bad is Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that sounds more like the protocols of the elders of Zion than like serious scholarship. But you know, that, that was what we had to contend with. On the other hand, there were some you know, very fine appreciations that the parallels are parallels that we can learn from. And I'm, I'm going to be doing that for you, but I'm just gonna give you one parallel right away to show you how, if you wanna understand the Hebrew Testament, you should understand it as being in response to its environment, sometimes accepting, often revising, often rejecting. And the, the, the example that comes to mind most clearly, the most famous law code found in these uh, archeological expeditions, and you probably know it, is called the Law Code of Hammurabi. Does that ring a bell? And in fact, it's, I have a picture of it for you. If you look on the, uh, it's the second page, third page of the text, but the sec second page on the bottom, you see a, a picture of a god and a king standing and receiving something from the god. That's the top of the stele, which is the code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi is the standing figure. The god Shamash, the god of justice in the Babylonian religion, is giving Hammurabi these laws. Now, I don't think they teach this in law school today, but uh, anyone, anyone go to law school here? Okay, I think they didn't teach this in your law school. Um, code of Hammurabi, law number 16. No, okay. Anyone who fails, although it'll remind you of the Dred Scott uh, decision, which they did teach in law school probably, you know, history of bad decisions, right? <laughs> uh, Hammurabi Code num Law number 16. Whoever fails to deliver a fugitive slave back to his master shall be put to death. Contrast Deuteronomy chapter 23. Do not return a fugitive slave to his master. Let the fugitive slave live in any of your settlements that he chooses to live in. So when you see that kind of stark contrast, you can understand that the exact phrasing of the biblical law has in mind a prevalent law that it wants to dissent from. So sometimes what we learn from this archeological and cross-cultural exploration is that the Hebrew Testament is against its environment. 
but the specific terms in which it's against the environment are only clarified when we know what the environment was. So that's just one little example of how taking this secular derived scholarship can actually help us in our own faith quest for understanding. Now, one or two more uh, basic and overarching remarks. This is the Hebrew Bible. <coughs> Looks like a finished product, right? I'd like us to understand this as a process that finally yielded this. So we're talking about a thousand years or more of lived experience. The Israelites encountering life, interpreting their experiences from their religious consciousness and memorializing that learning from their victories and deliverances, learning from their fail, hopefully learning from their failures and setbacks, pondering how to avoid a setback the next time. And when we, when we correlate the lived experience and the meditation on that lived experience with the words that come out, it's my belief that we're going to have an enhanced appreciation of the words of scripture. So that's, that's what's new about our new look. New, newness number one, that we're willing to take in some extra biblical sources of knowledge to contextualize and intensify our knowledge of what the scripture is telling us. And new number two, that we're bringing in a historical consciousness to see how the people who lived this, their lives help us understand it. Now, at this point, I should deal with a dogmatic question. Isn't the Bible from God? If the Bible from God, what matter does it make if it was given to people in a corner of the Sinai Desert or in a bend of the Mississippi River? You know, Mark Twain said that the Garden of Eden was Niagara Falls. And when Adam and Eve got kicked out, they had to go to Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is the best put down of Buffalo I've ever heard. <laughs> By the way, you should read that. He, beautiful, beautiful, short, short books he wrote, The Diary of Adam and The Diary of Eve. Eve is a humanity 2.0. She's smarter, she's more capable, you know, she, God's learned everything from the 1.0 experience and, and Eve is really tops. The, the, the dinosaurs love her. She has the idea to turn the brontosaurus into a, a portable bridge. I mean, Baltimore could use that right now. You know? <laughs> the only problem is she can't get Bronte to sit still because he's always following her like a puppy. So she, she can't get him to sit still in the river. <laughs> it's a lovely, lovely book. He, he wrote it, uh, Samuel Clemens wrote it after his wife, beloved wife, lifelong partnership after she passed away. And he has Adam standing at Eve's grave and he says, and he was not an articulate man, but he, she teaches him finally to become a little bit articulate. He says, I now know that paradise was wherever she was. Isn't that just beautiful? It's like meltingly beautiful. So you gotta read it. You can read the whole thing on a Saturday afternoon. The Diaries of Adam and Eve. Okay, so. I want to uh, give us some historical framework for the balance of our session today. And then um, next, next week, we're gonna really dig into the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. I want you to know ahead of time that we're going to be looking at the following texts next week. So you may wanna look at them ahead of time. Uh, we're looking at um, texts from the book of Judges Let's say the first five chapters of Judges will, will suffice. Judges, Judges. First five chapters of the book of Judges. Um, have a look at uh, Exodus uh, and contrast the prose of chapter 14 with the poetry of chapter 15. 
and also um, have a look at the, the, the ancient poems that represent blessings of the tribes of Israel. Uh, Genesis chapter 49 and uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 33. These are very ancient texts. Without getting too much into the weeds of linguistics, I'll show you how we know that they are older than the other texts. I, I'll, I'll be able to demonstrate. If you had a Norton anthology of English poetry and you were looking at Shakespeare and Spencer and, and uh, that Elizabethan, and then suddenly you flipped a page and you saw Beowulf, right? you'd know it's older literature, right? It's just, you can do the same thing with the Hebrew. Okay, so we'll do that next time. But now we're going to fill in. Very important thing to realize is that the Hebrew experience is not at the dawn of Middle Eastern history. There is already a long, long established civilization. And the civilization has two um, superpowers. Uh, and the reason why those places are superpowers is geography, right? If you don't know much about geography, remember that song? you're gonna have a hard time understanding history. The Nile, right? The, the, the gift of the Nile to the peoples of, of Egypt meant that they had an unfailing source of water and of um, fertilizer when the river would overflow its banks and deposit silt on the, on the fields. So Egypt very quickly got to the point of being able to produce a food surplus. Food surplus allows cities. I mean, just think about it. If everyone spends all their time growing the food they, or hunting the food they need, no one's going to build a city. Cities allow civilization, which also allows government, which also allows oppression, <laughs> taxes, forced labor, which also allows accumulation of wealth which also invites attacks from have-nots. Why do bank robbers rob banks? That's where the money is, right? Why do nomads invade cities? That's where the money is. What do the city folks do? They build walls. Right? So the, the archeological footprint of the Bronze Age shows us that the world was getting more complex, more politicized, more long distance connected. We, we see um, in, in the archeological excavations, we see um, jewelry, for example, that comes from stone that was not lo local to the region where we're digging. So we know that there's long range trade going on. So it's, it's a world which is getting more and more complex. The, uh, the one great power in the south is Egypt because of the gift of the Nile. In the north, you have two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. The land between those two rivers is um, Mesopotamia, which is Greek for between the rivers. Meso, right, middle, right? You know that from medicine, right? Meso is middle. Potamos, what's a hippopotamus? A river horse. Okay, so Potamos is Greek for river. Mesopotamia, the land between the two rivers. And in, in the Bible, it's called the same thing. Aram Naharaim, Aram of the two rivers, meaning the uh, Tigris and the Euphrates. So in the two rivers area, there were also great political powers. At first they were city-states, like the city-state of Sumer, and then they were actually empires, the Akkadian, the Assyrian Empire, later on the Babylonian Empire, finally the Persian Empire. So one state after another. It's tough for the little guys to make a living when the big boys are controlling everything. We find the emergence of small states like the tribes of Israel just around the end of the second millennium, which is to say 1200, 1100, 1000 before the Christian era. So, in a world with big boys, right, the uh, Egyptians in the south, the Mesopotamians in the north, how could there be an emergence of a little place like Israel? 
Well, the answer is they both had to have been collapsing at about the same time. What could cause a collapse of just one? Its own political problems, right? The uh, Soviet Union collapsed by 1991 because of the internal inconsistencies that it could never solve, right? Communism could never provide a rationale for people to want to work harder. And so eventually, despite everything it tried to do, the Soviet Union just couldn't make a go of it. But what would make both superpowers collapse at the same time? We believe the answer is probably a climate answer. We believe that around 1200 uh, periods of drought uh, stressed the entire Eastern Mediterranean and Persian Gulf region to the point where there were invasions, people leaving their native land and going somewhere else trying to have greener pastures and so on and so forth. Lots and lots of fighting. We know from Egypt about something called the peoples of the sea. And you'll see a picture of this um, on the inside page that begins with 1200 to 1000. You see that? On the bottom you see battle between Egyptian forces and the sea peoples. So the Egyptians um, claim to have defeated them. By the way, every Egyptian claim of victory you have to take with a grain of salt. <laughs> Everyone. But maybe they did. We think that amongst these sea peoples were the Philistines, people who left the Aegean. Maybe they were chased out by stronger people who came in, who maybe had more advanced iron technology, forced them out. They got into their longboats and they landed on the coast of Gaza. And they they were the original rulers of the Gaza Strip, were the Philistines. That's why the country is called Palestine. It's from the Philistines. So what we know is that there was a lot of turbulence. And we also know that there were Israelites living in Israel by then. How do we know that? That's very interesting. Take a look one page before that at something called the Mer Nephthah Stele. That's in the Cairo Museum. It's a big, tall victory slab. You've got pictures of the Pharaoh on the top, and then you've got tech, line after line after line of text. I beat up this guy, I beat up that guy, I beat up the next guy. Mostly having to do with all his victories in the uh, West part of his kingdom, facing Libya. Then near the bottom where you see a little crack, he says, I also launched an expedition against Canaan and I destroyed the city-state of Gezer and I destroyed the city-state of Yenoam and I destroyed the city-state of this and I destroyed the Israelites. He doesn't use the word city-state, he says, I destroyed the Israelites. Their seed are no more. Well, first of all, that's a typical boast because their seed are more. <laughs> their seed are not no more. However, this is the first time in world literature where someone not in the Bible says there was a people Israel living in the land of Canaan. And we know about when Mer Nephthah lived because of all of the advances of the study of Egyptian history, thanks to the decoding, the deciphering of um, hieroglyphics. So we know that this stele is from the year 1208 before the Common Era. So can we correlate that with the Bible? Yes, we can, although people do it in different ways. The way I correlate it is this would put the Exodus at about 1300 or the 1200s, sojourn in Sinai, entrance into Canaan, already established in Canaan by the end, which is the low 1200s, such that a later Egyptian pharaoh is boasting about having invaded Canaan and defeated the Israelites there. So this is an anchor point where we begin to move from what may purely be legendary to what may be more historically established. Isn't that interesting? So 
there may be much in the Bible of historical value, but this is where we start finding proof, corroboration. Okay, that's a good place to stop for now. I hope that I've intrigued you and that we're gonna be able to continue together. <laughs>